Welcome to the forum, live streamed worldwide from the Leadership Studio at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I'm Dean Michelle Williams. The forum is a collaboration between the Harvard Chan School and independent news media. Each program features a panel of experts addressing some of today's most pressing public health issues. The forum is one way the school advances the frontiers of public health and makes scientific insights accessible to policymakers and the public. I hope you find this program engaging and informative. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to the forum. I'm Marty Cady, and I'm the editor of Politico Pro, and I'll be serving as today's moderator. Our panelists, I'm going to introduce them right now. To my immediate right are Bob Blendon, professor of health policy and political analysis at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the Harvard Kennedy School. Richard Frank, professor of health economics in the Department of Healthcare Policy at Harvard Medical School. Martin West, professor of education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Joining us remotely is Sheila Burke, adjunct lecturer in public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. This event is presented jointly with Politico LLC and we are streaming live on the website of the forum, on Politico, as well as on Facebook and YouTube. This program will also include a brief Q&A so you can email questions to theforum at hsph.harvard.edu and we'll try to answer some of those questions both from the live audience and uh, whatever you uh, email in. There's also a live chat happening on the forum site right now. So as we open this forum to, to discuss healthcare and education priorities in the new Congress, we're really doing this at a fraught moment in American history. Uh, to put it bluntly, uh, our government appears to be in a crisis. We're on day 33 of the longest government shutdown in history. It's a shutdown long enough to have caused, cost billions of dollars in economic damage and incalculable damage to our national political dialogue. I live in the Washington area and many of my neighbors are furloughed, uh, deciding what bills to pay and what bills not to pay. Uh, I flew up here yesterday to Boston. The TSA agents who screen my bags are going on a month without pay. Everything from school lunches to food inspections to national parks are threatened by an intractable debate about a wall at the U.S.-Mexico border. So it's with that context, perhaps that cloud, that we will discuss uh, what our panel of experts thinks could happen on healthcare and education policy. This could happen either in Congress, through the courts, through the executive branch, maybe we'll even talk about what's happening at the state level, um, if and when Washington returns to some level of normalcy. But first, we wanted to examine what do Americans say about the new Congress's top priorities. Politico and the Harvard T.H. Chan School condu conducted polls of Americans to find out. These polls will serve as a background for today's discussion, but we're also gonna talk more broadly about what actions could happen in this divided Congress. Uh, we're gonna set up the conversation here with a brief video clip about the top health issue that, that came up for Republicans and Democrats, uh, drug prices. And this is a clip from the uh, U.S. Department of Health and Services. Let's see the clip. I was diagnosed with chronic myelogenous leukemia. With breast cancer. My kidneys continue to deteriorate. I have, in this last year, had to pay over $10,000 in medical costs for my drug to keep me alive. My medications are quite expensive. The out-of-pocket costs were staggering, over $5,000. So I just ended up charging a lot of it on a credit card. I probably won't retire. I am not gonna drain my savings account. I'm not gonna sell my home. For too long, there's been a lot of talk on drug prices and no action. It's time for drug prices to go down, not up. My administration is launching the most sweeping action in history to lower the price of prescription drugs for the American people. American Patients First, hhs.gov slash drug pricing. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services at taxpayer expense. Bob, will you give us an overview of these poll findings and what they tell us about where the American public is on these policies? Yeah, uh, Marty, let me try to be helpful. Uh, so uh, when this shutdown is over, we're going to have a country in Congress that's unbelievably angry. They're also going to be very polarized. What we're trying to do in a very few minutes is to use a poll we did to find if there could be any common agreement 
on issues that people would work on. And, and, and very briefly, the research and the news coverage is not the same. It turns out when you study a Democratic House, they actually follow what Democrats think much more than the public. When you follow a Republican Senate, they're likely to follow what Republicans say. So what I'll briefly go to show is what people say are the top priorities for this Congress, hoping something would get done. And then we're going to briefly look at, do they agree on anything? Uh, and then my colleagues are going to talk about what might happen in areas where there's even uh, uh, some agreement uh, for this. So one thing about our poll with Politico is most polls you see about priorities give people five choices. We gave them 21. Anything that appeared in the major news uh, was on a list. So if we can have the first PowerPoint uh, briefly. Uh, so these were out of 21, uh, the top uh, 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 six, lowering prescription drugs, reducing the deficit, which I think the tax bill got people nervous, spending on infrastructure, and you actually have to describe to people you're talking about bridges and highways. They have no idea what that infrastructure word means. Uh, reducing the number of hate crimes. Uh, uh, briefly, we've gone from worried about international terrorism uh, to actually hate crimes in the United States. Uh, addressing opioids and spending on kindergarten to 12 public education. Uh, the next PowerPoint, briefly, uh, all you have to look at is the yellow. Uh, given the top uh, six, do they, Republicans and Democrats agree on anything? And it's only on prescription drugs uh, that in terms of, of the hierarchy. But I want to take a quick look. Just take a look at Republicans one, two, and three because you can explain uh, why there's a shutdown. One is drugs, two is unauthorized immigration, three is a budget deficit. On the Democratic side, it's drugs, uh, uh, climate change, uh, which doesn't show up on the Republican list at all, and re renewing DACA. So now you know exactly what the, uh, the negotiations are going on uh, in, in Washington. And then we looked at uh, just health and education much more narrowly uh, uh, for that. So we go to the next slide. And we looked at health first. So to no surprise, again, drug prices is the top of the list. Uh, but what showed up in the election is here, uh, an idea that it was only an insurance term protecting people with serious illnesses is now so much in the core uh, of American life. And to the surprise of everybody, it was an election issue, but both, uh, you'll see in a minute, Republicans and Democrats do not want Medicare touched. Uh, lowering overall uh, health care uh, costs and uh, uh, biomedical research. So is there any agreement between the parties? Next slide. And so it turns out in the health areas, there's more agreement. What don't they agree on? Republicans are high on reducing health care costs uh, and veterans, and they don't show up on the Democratic list. Uh, and uh, Democrats are high uh, on fixing the ACA, uh, uh, but not on the Republican list. And biomedical research is still higher uh, with Democrats. So you see some possibilities here. Uh, two of them are just sustaining what the existing programs are, uh, but prescription drugs shows at the top. Uh, the last, we take a look at two at education. And there's a smaller list because education has not had the same national focus. And so you can't give them 24 items when people aren't proposing uh, uh, for this. So let's go to the next slide. And so the top education are our student debt. For those of you who don't follow this, 10 years ago, there was no such thing as a polling issue called student debt. Uh, it just would never show up. Now it, 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 it's the top. Uh, the spending issue, spending for local community colleges, uh, investing in school buildings, and uh, the last is expanding charter and private schools. But watch when you look at the uh, partisan split, and it's the last slide. Uh, so what you see is, in the narrow area of education, Democrats and Republicans agree on everything but two. Uh, Republicans are interested in expanding uh, charter and private schools. Democrats are not. Uh, Democrats are interested in regulating for-profit colleges and technical institutes. Uh, Republicans are not. So this is the uh, agenda, and the question for my colleagues are, 
given the animosity between the parties and where we are, is it possible that these can happen? And if it is, what would happen that would be helpful? But that's the, the background. You have some background of where people believe the Congress should go in the next year. Thanks, Bob. That's a great foundation uh, for uh, this discussion today. There's a fascinating consensus uh, between the parties on certain issues, but then when you get down to tactics, when you um, go back inside Congress, uh, what we're likely to see is, is gridlock. What, what the American people are telling us through this poll is one thing, and you do start to see the ideological breaks. But um, moving back to Washington, uh, the likeliest scenario for this Congress uh, broadly is that this new invigorated House Democratic majority run by Nancy Pelosi and a young, diverse group of Democrats will pass a lot of bills that reflect the progressive agenda. Um, and a lot of people with an eye toward what the 2020 agenda should be, and almost everything will die in the Republican Senate. So if we restrict our conversation just to what will Congress do, it's going to be a very short forum. So uh, <laughs> we're, we're going to, uh, we're also going to include um, the potential for uh, executive action, uh, what, what can happen in the courts on these policies, and um, what's happening in, in, in the states. Uh, at the state level, you're, you're, all, you're possibly going to see a lot of action on healthcare, on education, on Medicaid. States have really become laboratories of innovation on policy, um, chiming in where the federal government has failed. Uh, so let's go to drug pricing, Richard. You've studied the forces that drive prescription drug pricing in the United States. Uh, there's, this is the number one thing in the poll. Republicans, Democrats, independents all believe they pay too much for drug prices. Um, that clip was really compelling. Um, and uh, th there was, you hear those stories over and over. Um, we had the clip of President Trump and Secretary Azar saying, we're doing something about drug prices, but let's get realistic. Give us a roadmap on legislation, reg regulation, and uh, executive action. What do you see ahead? Yeah, well, I think um, prescription drug policy is a bright spot. And, um, you know, at the risk of being Pollyanna, uh, I think that um, there's progress to be made here uh, 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 in a bipartisan way. I think uh, there have been actions taken by the uh, FDA. There are proposals right now uh, in the Congress uh, and being made by the Trump administration that offer, I think, reasons for optimism. Uh, for example, the FDA has taken a number of actions to promote more competition by easing the way for generic drugs to come to market. So this includes putting more money into getting drugs onto the market faster. Uh, it involves um, sort of curbing some of the practices uh, that have been used to keep uh, uh, generic drugs off the market uh, and uh, sort of limiting the ability to exploit sort of uh, consumer protections and safety. Uh, and so I think that um, They've taken some good uh, first steps, and there are now bipartisan proposals uh, sort of working their way through the Congress uh, that will build on that. Uh, you know, one example is a thing called the CREATES Act, which is really aimed at um, uh, taking a bipartisan approach to curbing anti-competitive actions that make it harder for generic drugs to show that they're bioequivalent, that they're equally uh, uh, effective. And um, that, uh, that bill, I think, is going to come up. I, and I'm very optimistic that it'll, it'll pass and it will make a difference. It will save billions of dollars. Um, a related policy domain is in the area of competition for biologic drugs, where we have the possibility of uh, a new class, a new set of drugs called biosimilars, which are like generics but for biological drugs. And the FDA has been uh, slow in getting uh, the regulations to bring those to market, but uh, there's impatience on both the Democratic and the Republican side, and um, you see us trying to learn lessons from Europe here to get those drugs to market quicker and, again, save billions of dollars because all the really expensive drugs that you read about in the newspaper every day, but in most part, are biologics. And so that's a great place to save. A um, couple of other areas where I think, um, uh, in a sense, there's low-hanging fruit. Uh, one is uh, anti-gouging legislation. There are several bills in Congress right now. I think it's a real, e it's an easy one. Uh, here we are in the middle of an opioid crisis, and we have some of the most effective drugs being jacked up about 600 percent a year. And I think that uh, people on both sides of the aisle are outraged by that. 
And uh, so I think that uh, offers a possibility. And then finally, I think uh, one of the things that came through loud and clear in the election is that um, uh, wholesalers, manufacturers, pharmacy benefit managers all make money from the way that prices are set. The people that get hurt by the price setting arrangements are consumers because they pay list prices and don't share in the actual transaction prices post rebate. And I think, uh, again, both sides of the aisle say we've got to do something to fix this and allow the consumers to share in the uh, sort of cost effective uh, gains that we've made. Well, uh, thanks for your optimism sure. in this moment of, uh, yes. <laughs> of, of gridlock. Uh, it's unusual when the president, the, the Republican Senate, and the House uh, Democrats might actually agree on something. So um, maybe you, you've got a more optimistic outlook than a lot of folks here. Uh, two other health issues we want to uh, touch on here that, that came up in the polls. Uh, Americans are overwhelming concerned, overwhelmingly concerned with protecting Medicare and keeping coverage for pre-existing conditions. Uh, this is across the board, rhetorically. but. As Sheila knows, when you, when you dig into the actual bills, especially some of the Republican bills, there are some um, cheaper sort of off-brand uh, insurance plans that might not c uh, cover pre-existing conditions. Uh, Sheila, can you talk a little bit about those two priorities and what you expect to see here? And feel free to cover Congress, executive action, uh, wherever you see the, the, the roadmap ahead on this. Thanks so much, Marty, uh, and thanks for including me today. Uh, Medicare, as Bob knows and, and Richard certainly knows, remains enormously popular. Uh, among the American public, and it is approached with great caution by both sides of the aisle uh, and both bodies. Uh, while the House leadership, the new leadership, is inevitably going to raise a number of the suggestions about Medicare buy-ins and Medicare for all, uh, and will no doubt try and respond to those issues that arose during the course of the election, uh, I think it is unlikely that any major moves will be made with respect to the Medicare program on either side of the aisle. Uh, unfortunately or fortunately, we are already in the 20 cycle, so people are already looking towards the 20 elections, and I think they approach Medicare and the suggestion of doing anything to Medicare that will alter it any dramatic way essentially will fall flat. Uh, but I think there is going to be real focus on strengthening the program, and I think there'll be discussions that take place about what might one do with respect to the current structure of the program, which has remained largely intact since 1965. Um, certainly incremental changes may well be discussed. Uh, drugs, as Richard has suggested, there's a big piece of the Medicare program and a lot of the discussion around drug reform, which has to do with the cost of drugs to Medicare beneficiaries. So we already know the administration and the Congress has begun to look at some of those questions around negotiation, around the price point, around rebate strategies. Uh, but there are also other elements of the Medicare program that people have talked about strengthening. There are a bucket of things that Medicare does not currently cover that people have suggested really need to be added to the program. Issues around dental coverage, interestingly enough, vision coverage, hearing coverage, um, and really the out-of-pocket costs because there's no real catastrophic protection for folks that are in the traditional Medicare program. So I think there'll be attention given to some of those issues by Democrats and Republicans. Uh, I also think there'll be efforts to try and simplify the program. The Medicare Advantage program, which is the managed care piece of the program, now has about 30% of the population enrolled in those programs. And there are questions about simplifying that program, uh, about access issues, issues like telehealth and other opportunities to essentially make services more readily available. Uh, one of the other interesting questions that may arise are over the historic Stark rules. Uh, about uh, essentially the protections under HIPAA and Stark, and whether they are inhibiting the development of organized programs. Both the administration and many others are interested in getting Medicare beneficiaries into organized systems of care, believing that coordinated care, in fact, will improve the health of our elderly and disabled citizens. So there'll be attention to those kinds of questions. Senator Grassley, uh, the incoming chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, who had been chairman previously, uh, has a long-standing interest in oversight uh, and has indicated already his interest in looking at the Medicare program, looking at fraud and abuse, looking at the cost of the program. I fully expect he will do that. 
Uh, incoming Chairman of Ways and Means, Mr. Neal, has also indicated an interest in looking at oversight, but also interesting looking at what the administration's doing in terms of demonstrations with respect to the Medicare and Medicaid programs, but particularly the Medicare program, and wanting greater transparency over what in fact might occur. With respect to essentially pre-existing conditions, in sort of my short comments, um, a couple of things come to mind. One is people are increasingly sensitive to the increasing number of the uninsured. We're upwards of 13.7 uh, or almost 14 percent now uninsured, so those numbers are going up. So the question about pre-existing, the question about coverage availability is one that in fact is of concern on both sides of the aisle. As Bob has suggested, deep divisions over the fundamentals of the ACA. Of course, we have the Texas court case, which has called into question the fundamentals of the ACA, uh, although it is on pause as a result, frankly, of the, uh, of the shutdown. Uh, but on January the 29th, the Ways and Means Committee has scheduled a hearing on oversight, essentially looking at the pre-existing condition issue, uh, looking at what those solutions might be, and it is the one piece uh, where, in fact, both Democrats and Republicans seem to have an interest in finding a resolution uh, as to what one might do to that. The president has sent sort of mixed signals. Uh, he wants to be sure they're covered, but then, of course, they put forward the short-term plans, uh, which will be permitted to avoid any of the requirements under the ACA. So those questions, the questions of what the administration is doing on a regulatory basis, as well as legislative attempts to try and fix that issue, I think will be on the agenda for both the House and the Senate. Thanks, Sheila. And uh, we'll be coming back to a lot of the politics of, of the ACA and, and the future uh, as, as this uh, panel goes on. But uh, we're going to shift to education here. Uh, another uh, perhaps a bright spot in the poll uh, in a country so bitterly divided over politics, uh, there was some unity on increasing spending on K-12 through education, on uh, funding for community college, and uh, overwhelming concern about student debt. Uh, that's where there's unity. The tactics on how to, what to do about it is where the, the, it sort of falls apart. Martin, um, thanks for coming on here. You're our education expert. What's the outlook for Congress and the executive branch on education policy uh, on, on these various topics? Well, thanks for having me. Let me start with the issue of increasing spending on K-12 education, where despite the very interesting poll results, I think you're very unlikely to see much in the way of substantive change. Major changes to federal spending on discretionary programs like education tend to happen in the context of major reauthorizations of, uh, of laws, uh, like the Every Student Succeeds Act, which governs federal involvement in K-12 education. And while that law is technically up for reauthorization this year, there is absolutely zero appetite in Congress to revisit what was a very hard-won bipartisan compromise in 2015. And I think the overall budget picture which includes the threat of sequestration cuts if there's no new budget agreement, means that those who are pushing for increases in any discretionary spending category have very, very little leverage. Um, now, in, in making that prediction, I should note two caveats. One is that I do think the poll results help us understand why, despite calls from Republicans to reduce the federal footprint in education, to even eliminate the Department of Education, after two years of unified Republican control, you actually haven't seen a decrease in federal spending on education. Uh, you, education's actually fared quite well over the past two years from a budget perspective. And I think that's because cutting education spending at any level of government is just not a political winner right now. And that's what I think you're seeing reflected in the poll results. And the, the second caveat is that it's very important to keep in mind that the federal government is just a 10% investor or less in K-12 education. Uh, and so that means even any a very substantial increase or reduction in federal spending on K-12 education doesn't really translate into a major change in the level of resources available uh, in a given school. Uh, as in most aspects of our education system, the real action is at the state and local level, and you have seen increased activism uh, around issues of school funding and teacher salaries uh, in, in the past year that we can return to later. Now, on student loans, I think it's important here to distinguish between efforts to reduce the debt load of students, former students who are currently repaying loans, and efforts to fix the student loan system going forward. The former may be a desirable goal, uh, particularly as concerns mount that 
debt loads may be holding back the economy. And I suspect you'll hear Democratic presidential candidates talking about that a lot on the uh, campaign trail. Um, but it does nothing to increase access for students to higher education going forward. On the, on the latter, this question of actually increasing access, I think the big question is whether Congress is going to be able to reach agreement on a reauthorization of the Higher Education Act. And there, the major player is Senator Lamar Alexander from Tennessee. He's a former Secretary of Education, former university president. He's recently announced that he's not re running for re-election in 2020. He wants to go out with a legacy bill, and this would be the opportunity to do that. He's made, I think, good progress in creating some bipartisan consensus around the goal of simplifying the federal financial aid system and creating some accountability for colleges by putting them on the hook if their students don't repay their loans. Um, I think the big question then is whether the areas where there's not bipartisan consensus, questions like campus safety and sexual assault, federal regulation of that under Title IX, whether they will get in the way of the ability to reach a, a, a deal going forward. The other prediction that I think it's very safe to make uh, with respect to the new Congress is just that you'll see a ramped up oversight function in the House of Representatives uh, with respect to the Department of Education. So incoming chair of the Education and Labor Committee, Bobby Scott from Virginia, has indicated that you know, he's going to be holding hearings. He's going to be requesting information uh, from the department, particularly with respect to issues of civil rights protections in schools and the regulation of for-profit colleges. Uh, these are areas where the Trump administration has made some significant changes through executive action to Obama-era policies. And I think you'll see a lot of examination of those areas uh, over the months to come. Well, um, as we've heard, uh, thank you, Martin. Um, so the student loan debt is a big burden for many Americans. Uh, we've got another clip uh, here. This is this clip is from the nonprofit Student Debt Crisis. Uh, let, let's roll that clip and then uh, discuss. I am 30 years old, and I am currently $38,500 in student loan debt. I am in student loan debt. $23,522.01 of student loan debt. I'm 29 years old and I have $60,000 in student loan debt. $70,026 of student loan debt. $44,000 of student loan money to get my master's degree. Today I owe $89,000. Hi, I'm Congressman Eric Swalwell, and I represent the 15th District in California. I have about $100,000 in student loan debt. I've worked at times four jobs. I've been making thousands of dollars worth of payments, and I'm barely keeping up with the interest. The rent was $250 a month, and my car payment was $180 a month. I do not want to be paying off my student loan when I'm 80, when I'm 70, when I'm 60. That's a uh, pretty sobering clip. Yeah. Um, and uh, really a wide range of, of people talking, a wide range of ages, too. So this is clearly a, a national problem. Um, it, it's a crisis for a lot of Americans, a crisis for parents trying to save, um, adults trying to pay it off. Um, can you talk a little bit more about some of the um, options for this? You, you mentioned um, Lamar Alexander's um, higher education bill, and um, would that impact this at all, or are there other uh, innovative ideas around student debt. I think that's an important topic, especially in a higher education setting here. Yeah, I think it's uh, important as we start talking about the student debt issue to make sure that we have a good understanding of where the problem is most severe. And it turns out that if you look at who's struggling in terms of repayment, who's defaulting on their student loans, is generally not those borrowers who have significant debts, those who have borrowed to go to a four-year school, especially those who borrow to go to graduate school who tend to have the largest debt loads uh, and ultimately tend to uh, be very successful economically and to be able to manage that repayment burden. Uh, where the problem is most severe uh, is people who have very modest loan amounts, generally under $20,000, who have borrowed to attend a career uh, training program, maybe in the for-profit sector, have failed to complete it, failed to transition into the workforce. They're the ones who are really defaulting on their loans. Uh, and so I think the reason it's important to keep that in mind is that any sort of across the board debt relief proposal is likely to be quite regressive in its impact ultimately. Uh, and so I think that's where there's a need for uh, some creative thinking, as you say. Uh, the idea that's really emerged in higher education over the past couple of decades is the idea of income contingent repayment plans. So basing the amount that you repay uh, to some degree on your income. 
and uh, this would you know, target assistance where it's most needed. Uh, the reason it makes sense from an economic perspective is that college is generally still a very good investment. Uh, most people, as a result, are able to repay that loan uh, that they borrow, but it's also a risky investment. And uh, so I think um, uh, this is a good way to manage that risk. If it doesn't pay off for you, then you end up paying back less uh, and are less likely to go into default. Uh, you saw a big expansion in the availability of income-based repayment plans under the Obama administration. And interestingly, this isn't an area where you've seen the Trump administration roll back those programs. Uh, I think in the context of a potential congressional reauthorization of the Higher Education Act, you would see an attempt to really simplify and streamline the various options that are available to borrowers. They're ridiculously confusing right now. They require you to recertify your eligibility year to year. Uh, and so they're not as widely used as they should be already. And so I think that's an area where you'd see a lot of thought. Well, uh, thank you, Martin. Um, great overview on um, student debt. Uh, I'd like to go back to Sheila uh, to uh, pick up on something you mentioned, uh, the ACA lawsuit. Uh, the, basically, the entire ACA was thrown out um, by a Texas judge back in mid-December. Um, it's caught up in, in, in the courts now, and um, I think a lot of people were, were caught off, off guard with that. Um, it was thrown out of technicality, but uh, that was an ideological uh, decision, but one that uh, still reveals the ongoing legal fragility of Obamacare. We are uh, almost 10 years into this, this law, and um, it's extraordinary, I think, to, to people who don't follow this, that um, a lower court judge can um, try to toss the entire law um, out, uh, and uh, it'll go through the courts. But what is your outlook on that and any other legal challenges to Obamacare? I know one of the questions pending from our online audience is whether Obamacare is here to stay. Um, I don't know the answer, but maybe you can, uh, you can jump in there a little bit. I'm not sure any of us really know the answer. I mean, I guess I would posit that is it, in fact, here to stay. Um, but in fact, the court case did catch us by surprise. It, of course, is being appealed. Uh, the appeal is obviously on hold uh, while, the, um, while we're in this break period. Uh, but I think there is an ongoing set of challenges. Certainly there are the court challenges which are being appealed, but there's also the ongoing efforts on the part of the administration uh, with respect to the program that occur in a regulatory or an administrative way uh, that we continue to see, whether it's shortening the period of enrollment, whether it is uh, basically ceasing the funding for much of the outreach activities. Uh, so there's no question that there are efforts going on and will continue to take place. At the same time, I think there's an acknowledgement that there are elements of the ACA, had they been given the opportunity to repair or to fix the original legislation, uh, that folks would have liked to have go forward. Uh, there's an obvious question as to the benefit structure in the ACA and the fullness of the benefits and whether, in fact, that ought to be revisited. But I think we will continue to see this tension. Obviously, with the House now under Democratic control, you won't see the same kind of pressure that you saw from the House Republicans, essentially, pursuing legislation and moving it. The Senate has chosen not to pursue much of that work, but I think you have to assume that there will continue to be issues that arise. Uh, there are also issues taking place at the state level, uh, with a number of states, not only in the case of this court case, but a number of states that are seeking ways and waivers to essentially do a number of things, whether it's with their Medicaid program or whether it's restructuring their benefit structure or restructuring their insurance market. So I think we have to assume those conversations will continue to take place. Thanks, Sheila. Um, Richard, I want to go back to you on, on the question of, of drug pricing. I'm curious uh, what the industry's approach is going to be. They're going to get hauled up to the hill and um, uh, Democrats certainly love to have uh, pharmaceutical um, executives up there taking the oath and talking about, you know, being asked why um, insulin uh, costs, you know, so much. Uh, so uh, can you talk a little bit about industry strategy when it comes to dealing with the politics of drug prices? Well, yeah, we just saw a report that came out um, that, well, I guess la this past year has been the uh, biggest uh, uh, lobbying expenditure year in, in quite a while. I think it was around $26 million was spent uh, uh, by big pharma uh, lobbying. So, you know, uh, clearly they're not uh, standing still for this. And, you know, the I, I do think the actual picture uh, has uh, gotten more complicated. Uh, I mentioned earlier that there's this concern about uh, why is it that everybody's making money 
on the backs of consumers. And uh, I think uh, the entire w way that we've organized our supply chain and the way we put uh, uh, prices and discounts through the system uh, has created enormous complexity um, uh, and opportunities for uh, people with mark or firms with market power uh, all the way down through the supply chain to make lots of money while the consumers are paying prices that are way out of line with what any of the other players are paying. And so I think that's going to be a concern. And I think actually efforts to fix that will probably receive some support from the industry. And so that's, again, a common point where you can triangulate all the players sort of mostly falling on the side of fixing that. Trump is very unpredictable, as we all know. Do you see him doing something unilaterally on, um, on drug prices uh, to make a substantive and political point? Well, you know, there's this um, issue around um, his desire to introduce uh, European prices uh, into the uh, Medicare program for physician-administered drugs. And I think that's, uh, <coughs> that is an important signal because, uh, much like the Obama administration, it represents an effort to separate how you pay doctors from how you buy drugs. And so that's an important debate to have. Um, the actual specifics of the interna use of international prices to set prices here is, I think, less clear and much more controversial. And so whether we will actually land there, I think probably we won't. Um, but I think having a conversation about rearranging the way we pay for physician-administered drugs is important and will probably happen. Okay. Thanks. Um, let me go back to uh, Bob here, uh, back to the poll, the foundation of this discussion and uh, how it showed where American priorities are. Uh, there tends to be a mismatch between what people polled say are their top priorities and how they expect things to be carried out. That's where the ideological debate uh, really happens and that's where the breakdown happens in Congress. Uh, what does the polling show? Um, this poll, the first two polls of the year or previous polls that you've done, it shows sort of where the, where the breakdown happens. Uh, so, the, uh, and, and this is important uh, generically for people to recognize. When people often answer polls, they expect preferences about principles. I want something done about drug prices. When they learn about what it is, uh, they come apart. And so there's a real division about whether or not we should encourage just more market competition on the drug side. People just believe uh, for this. At the other side are people, let's get the government across from the pharmaceutical industry. And basically, and negotiation is, is a nice word for somewhat more price controls. And so one side, you, you split exactly on what, what you uh, do about that. So a lot of these policies, and the answer is, is, is uh, taxes, uh, when asked about should public school teachers be paid more, 73% uh, of people said, absolutely, those teachers are right. And then just a simple question, would you pay more taxes yeah. uh, to do that? Half said no uh, uh, f uh, for that. So these divisions about how the policies are, and it wouldn't be as difficult if people didn't separate by party. That is, if you didn't go to a different clubhouse, you, but now, if I don't want to pay those taxes, I'm in the party of no taxes uh, for that. So a lot of these issues come apart, not only because of the lobbying that goes on, but because how to solve them is not a, a uniform agreement. That doesn't mean they can't, uh, can't be done uh, for it, but it's harder because people have philosophical uh, uh, views. Uh, t take the issue uh, 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 of the ACA. There are people who agree there should be many more benefit choices that are available, and others who are very afraid of what that would be. And so fixing the ACA could be a very high priority, but the second line is, okay, we're going to have a thousand different policies. No, we're going to have two th that'll do this. So <coughs> the inability to agree on the it, and I, I just want to uh, alert people, this is the most poorly understood about polling. People like Medicare for all, they like this, and then they tell you they won't pay a dollar in taxes. Right. And so, unless you confront people with the actual choice 
uh, a lot of these polls are, are, uh, are not that suggestive. At the same time, I'll go back to this at the end. I think the political process will be unbelievably frustrated if two years from now, after people were told this election is one of the most pivotal elections in American history and nothing gets passed. So I don't want to, I'll have a new cynicism scale, but you were, everybody's going to be running in 2020 where really nothing could be done. We ran and we couldn't. I think that will be very, I think something on this list uh, will have to be done. I think there'll be a great deal of cynicism. Uh, but then again, I didn't predict who the president was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let, let's leave Washington for yes. a moment <laughs> after that, on that note, uh, and discuss, I know this, this panel's supposed to be about the, uh, the role of Congress. We've uh, established um, the divisiveness and the gridlock. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit with, with each of the panelists, if, if you have just a moment to weigh in, um, about the role of states. Uh, states are, have become real innovators on policy. If you watched uh, Governor G Gavin Newsom's uh, inaugural in California, he's proposing, proposing free community college. Um, if, you, if you look at the state-by-state -state actions in K-12 through education and in higher ed, there's a lot of innovation. There's things that are working in both Republican-run and Democratic-run states. On health care, um, you know, I was telling our panelists beforehand, our Politico Pro policy reporters, we have a lot of people in Washington, but we are finding um, more interesting stories in California and in New York and Florida and in Indiana, uh, places that are experimenting with uh, different ways to handle the ACA. Um, California wants to expand it, um, but you know, other, other conservative states are trying to uh, have work requirements around, around Medicaid. Uh, Indiana has passed uh, one of the most restrictive abortion laws in the country because they want to be the state that uh, makes the challenge against Roe v. Wade. So uh, maybe we can do a quick round robin with a few minutes left here before we go to our audience about what states you're watching and should our audience watch for like, hey, Washington is gridlocked. Here's, here's what can actually happen that, that, that could prove to be um, a productive policy uh, move. Um, I'll start with you, Martin. Sure, I'll start with one of the issues that you just mentioned, which is the notion of free community college. That proposal has been made in California and some other states uh, by incoming governors. Uh, what's interesting about it uh, is that it's uh, a bipartisan issue, uh, leading the charge Tennessee, a uh, traditionally conservative state. Um, and one of the reasons it's attractive to states is because it's relatively inexpensive to do. Community college is already quite affordable and uh, Pell Grant from the federal government covers much of uh, it for most students. Um, so I think you'll see continued interest in that. One concern there is whether that availability of a free option might induce some students who could have attended a four-year school to attend a two-year school uh, where completion rates tend to be quite low. Uh, and they might have been better off in a four-year option. So I think that's something uh, for policymakers to pay attention to. More broadly, I think at the K-12 level, you have seen some divergence uh, among states. There are several states that have uh, uh, taken various steps over the past decade to expand access to private schools. That really is a question addressed by state policymakers rather than the federal uh, government, despite <coughs> Secretary DeVos's uh, obvious interest in that. Um, and so states like Indiana, Florida, Ohio, Louisiana have gone quite aggressively in that direction. Uh, more blue states have avoided that altogether. And so there's an interesting divergence going on uh, that we can uh, learn from a lot going forward, I think. Uh, Bob, I don't think uh, many in the charter community would have appreciated your linking the notion of charter schools to private school choice yes, uh, in the right. poll question. Uh, charters that. have tried to <laughs> avoid that debate. Yes. Um, and I think you're going to see, uh, though, uh, ramped up conflict over the role of charter schools. Yeah. Uh, there has been a bit of partisan polarization on that topic in recent years. Uh, and so that's going to be something to watch going forward as well. Um, I'd like to just jump over to Sheila real quick. We've got about a minute here. Um, are there particular state uh, moves on Medicaid or ACA that we should be watching that will tell us something about where things are headed? I, I think, uh, Marty, as you suggested, there are a host of things taking place. Uh, certainly Wisconsin uh, is an interesting state to watch that's looking to expand its Medicaid program. Uh, Colorado and New Mexico 
uh, are both states that are looking to increase opportunities for coverage and are looking at public options and expansion. I think we also need to watch what the state insurance commissioners are doing in a variety of states, some of whom are trying to prevent the kind of changes that a short-term plan uh, might result in in terms of their risk pools and essentially drawing people out of the ACA plans. Uh, obviously, California, as usual, sort of leading a series of efforts, including wanting to provide coverage for undocumented uh, immigrants. Uh, and that is similarly, you've got that's taking place in New York, both in the city as well as in the state. Uh, so I think there are really a host of activities. Arkansas, of course, has led the effort on the work requirements. Uh, we're now looking at data that's suggesting close to 18,000 people will have lost coverage. So I think they're really each of the states, either in Medicaid, either to expand or the work requirement issues, other waiver requests that are coming forward from a number of states in terms of flexibility uh, under the 1115 waivers. And I think we also have to keep an eye on what the feds are willing to do, that is what the administration is willing to allow to go forward. Uh, and there's another court case before the Supreme Court, which is quite interesting, which is looking at CMS's authority with respect to its regulations and its pronouncements and what has to go through a public comment period. Uh, so again, I think there's a great deal taking place at the state level. Good. Well, thank you. Um, that the Arkansas case is an interesting example of um, what sounds good on paper. Let's have work requirements, if, if you're, especially if you're conservative, uh, for uh, Medicaid, and then 18,000 people end up getting kicked off. Don't know, I don't know if they intended that, but that's been the consequence. Uh, we're going to jump to some questions from both our online audience, and if we have time, uh, folks in our live audience can, can ask a question or two. Uh, there is one question about the poll, and uh, I'm, I'm glad this is in here because it's an interesting one. It uh, said the majority of Democrats uh, want to uh, repeal and replace the ACA. And when you pause and say, wait a second, that's not right, it's because they want something bigger. Uh, Medicare for all, um, single payer, um, you know, maybe a European style um, plan. Uh, Bob, can you talk about um, what the poll revealed on that question? Yeah, yeah. That is a question from our so, audience. So, a, a terrific question. H how can you have people incredibly in favor of something for repealing it? So it, uh, it turns out an accident of the poll is, if I want something bigger, I had no way to say that. So we looked at the second poll we did, and the results are, if a Democrat said, I want repeal and replace, almost 80% wanted Medicare for all. Uh, they wanted universal coverage. What they were saying is, the ACA is too anemic as it is. I need something bigger. But we only gave them one question. So Republicans were answering, I want this thing shrunken. Uh, I want a lot of conservative, and the Democrats in it wanted to have a debate <coughs> over Medicare for all. So we really, in the future, need to split that out. Uh, when you say that I want an alternative to the ACA, do you really want something larger and bigger that covers everybody, or do you really want something much more restricted? Uh, but our apologies to everybody. We got numerous emails about my, my neighbor is furiously in love with Medicare for all and said they wanted to repeal the ACA. Can you clarify that? We have. Uh, there's a uh, okay. specific question uh, uh, from uh, an online participant here uh, that, that, who didn't provide their name, uh, but for Richard, uh, th I don't want to duplicate what you've already talked about, but this person is asking, since reducing drug prices is uh, an area of uh, consensus, what is the first actionable steps we'll see? I know you addressed some of the legislative options, but if there's something specific that um, people out there should see as a signal that there's actually something happening on this. Yeah, I think you're going to see um, a lot more being done both in legislation and regulation to get generics on the market quicker, mm -hmm. to get biosimilars on the market, to just really amp up the competition. I think uh, everybody agrees uh, uh, that that's a good thing and we've seen uh, that when you do that, prices continue to fall. Um, and one for you, Martin, it's at the, uh, from, from one of our uh, online participants. Uh, the question is, given the student debt crisis, community colleges becoming increasingly more attractive, but it's still really expensive. What would have to be done at the federal level to make a difference in increasing access? Uh, this poll shows people are in favor of it, um, but uh, is there any uh, collaboration you see between uh, the Republican worldview and the Democratic 
world, you and you mentioned you know a lot of the the folks on the, in that video. Um, I don't know what their um, higher education background was, mm -hmm. um, but the, some of them didn't look like they had uh, just graduated from a four year college. Maybe had gone for a master's, taken some community college or or for profit school. And uh, but um, can you try to address this this question? Yeah, I mean a community college option is usually quite an affordable one, uh, contrary to what the the question suggests. Now there is the difficult issue of living expenses, and uh, it may be possible to. Um, sort of provide additional st uh, support for students as they uh, are going through the school beyond uh, tuition. Um, but uh, um, I, think, uh, I think that's where you'll see states trying to uh, innovate through the, the free community college type programs that I was mentioning uh, a moment ago. I think from a federal policy perspective, uh, the you know Pell Grant system is relatively well established. There's questions about who exactly is eligible and, and how you certify your eligibility, how we can simplify that for students and make sure that process is not a barrier. Um, but I think the real question is, how do we give schools some skin in the game when it comes to student results, right? And uh, I think finding a way to hold them accountable for their student success in repaying their loans has to be part of that conversation. And, and I think members of both parties have uh, come around to that view, sometimes reluctantly. Uh, the Obama administration really tried to advance that cause through something known as the gainful employment rules, which said that career-focused programs, mostly in the for-profit sector, uh, might lose their eligibility for federal financial aid if their students weren't successful in repaying their loans. There's been a lot of controversy around that proposal, uh, questions about its legality, its feasibility. The DeVos administration, uh, the Trump administration, Secretary DeVos, has, has repealed that approach. Um, and I think, uh, I think that's where the action will be going forward. I think the key step will be to make sure that it applies to all colleges, including community colleges, rather than appearing to single out the for-profit sector, which I think was one of the challenges with the Obama approach. Good. I want to put in a plug for a Politico story. Uh, we mentioned that Gavin Newsom, who's the governor of one of the more liberal states in the country, is pushing free community college. But we had a recent story in Politico about a, um, a community college in eastern Tennessee, um, it, which is a place that Trump won by a, a 40 or 50 points that has uh, long had um, a free community college. The, the name of the college is, is slipping, though, but uh, look it up. It's a really interesting story on um, a policy that is working in a different part of the country. Uh, I'm going to throw a question to Sheila here from um, it's from Joyce Frieden who is a news editor at MedPage today hi Joyce um, any thoughts on what might happen with the Medicaid program uh, she's specifically asking about whether the administration or congressional might Republicans will push for block granting Medicaid um, that's a long term conservative uh, priority block granting uh, federal money so that states can put their own ideological imprint on it is is something they'd love to do with Medicaid can you take that question Sure, thank you. It's a terrific question. Uh, there has been a very recent story suggesting that the administration was going to allow states to essentially seek through a waiver process the ability to block grant uh, and give them full flexibility in terms of the design of their Medicaid program. The other form of this is a per capita cap. Uh, both are resisted tremendously by Democrats. A uh, fear that the program, in fact, will not only change its nature because of the state's flexibility around issues like eligibility, but also that the funds over time will be inadequate to cover uh, the folks that are currently covered under the program. So uh, I fully expect that there will be continued pressure on the part of Republicans to pursue that or to allow the states to do it through a waiver process, but I think it will continue to be fought. Uh, tooth and nail by the constituencies over the entitlement program, nature of <coughs> Medicaid, and also those states essentially who are likely to lessen the number of things that are provided and lessen the coverage writ large. But Good. I assume it will come back up again. There's a question on uh, drug prices um, from, uh, from our online audience. Uh, what can be done to lower drug prices by reducing risk and inefficiency in drug development? For example, uh, this uh, questioner says that 90% of new drugs fail in phase three clinical trials. Um, so what is the, the uh, improvement that uh, could happen during the clinical process? I don't know if that st statistic is correct, but you can, you can correct as you go. But um, that's an interesting question. A lot of the cost is built into the process, not just at the retail end. Yeah, and um, there's, this is not a place to um, necessarily be uh, super optimistic. Uh, 
most of the cost of the uh, clinical trials comes from human testing. Yeah. And um, as you get more and more towards personalized medicine, as you get more um, uh, granular in, in your clinical targets, uh, in order, unless you have huge impacts on the disease, you need, you need very large samples. You need to do uh, big tests, and that's expensive. And, uh, you know, the combination of sort of having these targets and having uh, these uh, uh, dramatic uh, testing needs uh, does not leave me uh, optimistic on that front. You know, I do think that um, uh, artificial in, uh, intelligence, some of the big data things that we're seeing, offer some opportunities to sort of shave some costs. But I don't see a clear path right now to sort of dramatic changes there. Um, we're going to do some wrap up here. Uh, we have about four minutes to go, and uh, I'll, I'll ask each uh, uh, panelist to, to give a, a quick uh, takeaway on our discussion. Um, feel free to make any uh, bold predictions that are uh, sure to be wrong since we're uh, we're on tape. Uh, I'll start with you, Sheila. <laughs> Well, I think uh, your suggestion, uh, bold predictions, I think uh, the question is really what's unknown. Uh, I think we have to anticipate that there will be either actions on the part of the administration on a regulatory basis or an administrative basis uh, that we can't predict today that could have some enormous impacts on either the Medicaid program or the Medicare program. Uh, I think uh, it's a two-year period of time where there is deep division, as Bob has suggested, uh, with little where one sees the opportunity for coming together. Drug prices may be one of those areas, uh, but I worry that, in fact, we will make little progress on some of the other broad health care issues about which we are concerned uh, because of that fundamental disagreement as to what the role of the government should be. Uh, but I'm expecting and looking forward to the states testing out a lot of things uh, positively, one hopes, in terms of providing services and making uh, things more affordable. Martin? <coughs> Sure. Uh, so uh, I guess one prediction going forward, as we're sitting here, uh, teachers in the nation's second largest school system, Los Angeles Unified, have recently wrapped up a uh, week-long strike. Teachers in Denver have just voted to authorize a strike of their own. This comes on the heels of statewide walkouts in six states, including some quite conservative states last spring. Uh, I think there's a lot of activism around the issue of school spending and teacher salaries right now. Uh, and I expe expect that to continue. Uh, public sector unions, including teachers unions, recently lost the ability to collect agency fees from non-members for their representation services. They're out there really trying to demonstrate their value. And so I think you'll uh, see continued activism on that front. Uh, one last observation. I was wondering about my role on this panel and why it made sense to have one education uh, person uh, alongside multiple health uh, care people. I do think there is a natural connection between the two issues, however, uh, and that's because uh, this question of controlling health care costs, which came up in the polling, is one that matters for health care and also for education. If we look at what, why states have reduced their investment in higher education on a per student basis in the past few decades, the key driver seems to be that they're spending a lot more on Medicaid. So I'm not an expert on the healthcare con cost control front, but uh, I hope you all can do a good job because it will matter a lot for those of us who work in education. <laughs> and actually, Marty, if yeah. I could just add one ahead. note to that, that point, and that is the link between education and healthcare. And we know that the social determinants of health care and the contributors, education is an enormously important factor in terms of people's access to services and people's understanding. So there is a real linkage there in terms of how to make services available and how people take up those services. Um, Richard, any quick uh, wrap-ups yeah. or predictions for this year? Yeah, two things. I think that, um, you know, we all are clamoring and, and the public's clamoring for um, uh, quick action on drugs and things. I think it's important to have a new conversation. Uh, this has been lying dormant for about seven years since we had the last serious conversation. I think that there are huge problems in Medicare's drug uh, program that uh, will be important to address. And I think uh, having a conversation about how to do that, the negotiation issue, putting down on the table, what the ideas are and, and vetting them carefully, I think it's important. Just on one last point, which is slightly different, uh, 
I think one of the areas that showed up in Bob's poll but also shows up in the sort of state federal nexus is addressing the opioid po uh, problem. And I think uh, there is enormous bipartisan opportunity there and I think uh, leveraging all the tools we have at both the state and the federal level is uh, incredibly urgent to do and uh, really is, uh, should be the major responsibility of this Congress. Now, Bob, you're, you're the one who uh, monitors uh, trend lines and polls. What do you, where do you uh, see so things heading? The most practical takeaway is six months from now, the leaders of the parties are going to go off by themselves, and they're going to ask one question. Do we want to run in 2020 having done nothing? And uh, uh, President Trump's going to have to look in the mirror and say, what did I actually enact? And so, where there's a big difference about the future is, I think you can't be alone in that room and say do nothing. I think something here has to happen, that you actually go back to people and say, this just wasn't a sabbatical. We did something here. Uh, but others will write tomorrow, uh, no, the best advantage is to hold hearings and investigations and go home. I just think some of these issues, whether it's education or drug prices, they're actually going to have to act on because the cynicism of voters that you ran on these um, dramatic discussions and nothing happened is going to be very, very hard. But that's a prediction uh, of someone who's been wrong quite frequently. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'm a Washington journalist, so I'm, I'm trying not to do any predictions after uh, 2016. So I don't know what's in the Mueller report or what will be in it. I don't know when the shutdown will end or how it will end. And I don't know what the economy will be like a year from now when Democratic voters are going to the Iowa caucus and deciding among 30 to 40 Democratic <laughs> candidates. But I do know that those three things will be the cloud over these substantive issues as we roll through the next 6, 12, 18 months. Uh, we're going to wrap up here uh, on behalf of the Harvard TH Scan, TH Chan School of Public Health and Politico. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for, uh, for, for coming and thank you to our online audience. I'd like to put in a plug for uh, uh, the next forum. It's on February 1st. It's, uh, the title is Rare Cancers, Charting a Faster Route for Treatment. And with that, uh, we're going to wrap up. Thank you everyone for joining us in person and online.